to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. Former unified super featherweight champion Michaela Mayer says, I think the majority of my next big fights will be at 140 and 147. Probably at 147, because that is where all the girls are going. What services as confirmation of what I already thought when Michaela Mayer a few days ago hinted at yet another move upstairs, having moved up from 130 up to 135. She's now plotting a course up to 140 and 147. You'll never find a better sparring partner than adversity, said Michaela Mayer. Having since rebounded off her first professional loss to Alicia Boomgartner down there at Super Featherweight at Lightweight with Lucy Wildheart, a late replacement, I do think my best days are ahead of me. You have to remember, I didn't take up boxing until I was 18, Mayer told Fight Post. I have a lot of miles left in me. I'm still learning. I have only been boxing a short amount of time compared to most work World champions. I still have a ton that I want to do. I feel fine and I am finally letting my body fill out. So I feel stronger than I have ever felt. I have more experience, so I don't think I am on the decline just yet. Far from it. Kayla Mayer was always very big for 130 pounds, those kinds of physical dimensions. She could easily fill out Easy. to 140, 147, as high as 154, if I do say so myself. It's where former super featherweight champion Terry Harper currently campaigns. And if Terry Harper can campaign as a junior middleweight, I think Michaela can as well, breathing new life into that conversation. Going to 135, the goal was Katie Taylor. That was obvious. Winning the last belt made me mandatory for Katie, but the fight with Katie isn't possible. I am frozen out of a world title fight with her for at least a year, Mayer says, accepting that if she wants world titles, her immediate fighting future lies elsewhere. Katie has that rematch with Chantel Cameron, and then a rematch with Amanda Serrano. After that, I guarantee you that she will retire. I don't see her taking on the next generation of girls. And even if she doesn't, I can't sit around for a year and wait for that. There are plenty of big fights for me at the heavier weights. I think the majority of my next big fights will be at 140 and 147. Probably at 147 because that is where all the girls are going. I think 147 is the next exciting division. It used to be 135, but all the girls are going to 147 now. We are all sort of migrating to that weight class. You've got Jessica McCaskill, Sandy Ryan, and Natasha Jonas. Chantel has told me she is going to 147 after her rematch with Katie. We have spoken, and she asked if I could make 147 because she is interested in that fight. We are doing our next fight at 140, fighting a top contender there in September, and then we are looking at the next fight in December or January with one of the champions at 147. There are some big fights out there. Natasha is at a point in her career where she wants the big fights. There is Sandy because I think she beats McCaskill, and I really want to fight Chantel either at 140 or 147. Then you have Terry Harper. Like I said the other day on Twitter, she's still on my hit list. There are plenty of big fights out there for me in the next couple of years. Terry's at 154 right now. She's got the WBA title. Tasha Jonas has the other three, and I feel that soon, those three titles that Natasha won at 154, soon those titles are going to go vacant. Because Natasha moved down to welterweight, became IBF champion there very recently. Ideally, I would like to go to 147 and challenge Natasha Jonas or Sandy Ryan. But as you know, a lot of things can happen in boxing. Mayer says knowing results and politics often decide what comes next. What happens if Natasha or Sandy don't want the fight, but then Chantel is available at 140 and she wants to fight me and defend her titles against me. But what if Chantel wants to go to 147? I just don't know how things will unfold. What if Chantel vacates her belts at 140 and goes to 147 and the 140 belts become available? I would gladly do that. It's a similar situation that could play out at 154 because here's the thing. Kayla keeps mentioning Chantel Cameron fighting her at 140 for her belts, but here's the thing. What? Uh, I think winner lose in the Taylor rematch, Chantel's gonna go to welterweight. She's gonna go to 147. If Sandy Ryan beats Jessica McCaskill, I expect that the next fight could be Cameron versus Ryan. They have their own rivalry. That would be an in-house fight, an easy in-house fight for Matchroom to make. Michaela continued, I know Chantel really wants to fight me. We've exchanged a few messages. She's been really sweet. She said I beat Baumgartner and that I got robbed and feels really bad for me. Chantel says we would make a great fight and I would love to see us in the ring together. We would both get paid really well for that. I wished her good luck against Katie. I think she will beat her again so we can go from there. And like I said, 
Win or lose in the Katie Taylor rematch, I think Chantel's going to go to 147. I think she'll fight Sandy Ryan if Sandy beats Jessica. That's what I think. That's an easy in-house fight for Matchroom to make. And if Chantel does go to 147 and she vacates the titles at 140, maybe Michaela can go there and pick one up. Or maybe she can go to 154, pick up one of Natasha Jonas's old titles, which would then set up a unification match with Terry Harper. It's not just picking up alphabet titles. It's not just picking up the belts. It's being able to fight in big fights, meaningful fights, significant fights, that if by the time Natasha Jonas vacates the three belts she had uh, at 154, if Terry's still up there yeah. and Terry's still got a belt, yeah. Michaela can set up a unification match by picking one up. A newly vacated title. Similar situation could play out at 140 if Chantel were to vacate all the belts she holds there beyond the Katie Taylor rematch. Maybe Terry Harper can move down while Michaela Mayer moves up, meet in the middle. They get themselves some alphabet titles and unify with each other. There's a lot of ways it could break down, but essentially, Michaela is right. The biggest fights of her career lie north of lightweight. She can't afford to wait around for Katie Taylor. She's already put distance between herself and Alicia Baumgartner by moving up. We're not on the eve of that rematch. So fights with Natasha Jonas, Sandy Ryan, Terry Harper. Chantel Cameron, those are more realistic. Men's junior middleweight news. Ben Damon of Fox Sports AU tweeted, Tim Zhu expects Jermel Charlo to be stripped of his belts when he steps in to face Canelo Alvarez and thinks Charlo will get his ass whooped. Zhu wants to fight in Australia later this year and has named interim WBC champion Brian Mendoza as his preferred opponent. If he were able to get Brian in the ring and become a dual mandatory challenger by way of both the WBC and the WBO, that would line him up to win two of the four alphabet titles at this weight. The problem with that strategy is I've heard rumors and rumblings of a Fundora versus Mendoza rematch set to go down later on this year. If nothing else, that is a distinct possibility. Allow me to refresh your memory. Brian Mendoza is the guy who cleaned Sebastian Fundora's clock. That shock upset loss in what wasn't a high profile fight. It wasn't supposed to be. It resulted in a highlight real knockout for Brian Mendoza of Sebastian Fundora. A rematch between them is possible. If Tim Zhu wants to get that guy in the ring, the people at No Limit are going to have to hurry up and offer him something substantial because behind the scenes, wheels could already be in motion for a second Fundora fight. I don't think that Brian is necessarily obligated to give Sebastian a rematch, but a lot of weeks have passed since that knockout, and wheels could already be in motion for a second fight. So if he wants him, if Tim wants him, he needs to move fast. Tim Zhu, who sat down with Marcos Villegas. Tim is angry that he won't be fighting Charlo. He thought the news was a piss take. Says Charlo will get knocked out by Canelo. Says junior middleweight belts must be vacated. Absolutely. It's been over a year's time since Jermel Charlo fought Brian Castaño in their second fight, their rematch that saw Jermel become that division's undisputed champion. It's been well over a year's time, and it's not likely that Jermel will return to junior middleweight beyond the Canelo fight, whether he wins or loses. If he wins, he becomes undisputed at super middleweight. He'll stay up there. If he loses... He's still not likely to come down or come back right away. If he gets knocked out the way Tim thinks he's going to get knocked out, that guy's probably going to take a year off and spend some of the money he made from the Canelo fight. Still not going to come back right away, so Tim makes a valid point. Those belts should be vacated sooner rather than later. As it pertains to Tim Zhu, the WBO's interim champion, Josh Kelly of the United Kingdom. Josh, who was in action this past weekend and racked up another W, he's now number one in the WBO's junior middleweight rankings, meaning that if Jermel Charlo vacates or is stripped, then the interim belt holder, Tim Zhu, would be upgraded to full champion with Josh Kelly becoming his mandatory challenger. The last I heard, the WBO were on the eve of convening in reference to that situation, the WBO title at junior middle, because an order has already come down for Jermel to satisfy Tim Zhu as his mandatory, and because we know he's not going to. It's non-compliance is what it is. It's non-compliance from a direct order by the WBO to satisfy their mandatory challenger if he wants to stay champion. Clearly, Jermel is less concerned with the titles at 154 and more concerned with the ones at 168. So in all likelihood, the WBO title could be the very first title that he loses. Josh Kelly is ranked at number one. He's promoted by Vazerman. Vazerman, who very recently struck a deal to air their fights on the DAZN platform. Josh Kelly's last outing 
this past weekend was right there on his own. He racked up another W. In truth, I don't like Josh Kelly's chances against Tim Zhu. I don't really like Josh Kelly's chances against any solid junior middleweight. But for the time being, Zhu versus Kelly is a conversation. Is Josh Kelly willing to travel? Josh Kelly is not the draw in the United Kingdom that Tim Zhu is in Australia. Tim is a bigger draw, a bigger draw all around, and a bona fide pay-per-view attraction in his own neck of the woods, whereas Josh, Josh is not. He's never headlined a pay-per-view. Push comes to shove, and an order from the WBO comes down, ordering Tim to fight Josh Kelly. Where does the fight end up? Does it end up in Australia, or does it end up in the United Kingdom? By all rights, it's a bigger fight in Australia. It's an event. Is Josh Kelly willing to travel? Is Vazerman willing to send him there for the opportunity to become a world champion? That is the question. I think Tim knocks him out. Australia, yeah. United Kingdom, Tim knocks him out. Knocks out Brian Mendoza, too. I picked Tim Zhu to knock out Brian Mendoza comfortably. It's a good fight, and it's a solid fight, but I think it's a fight Tim Zhu would win. Tim Zhu's stiffest competition at this weight. It's not those two guys. And it's not the number two ranked Bakram Mertesaliev of Russia, who may be ranked at number two by way of the WBO, but he's in a pole position to become a champion by way of the IBF. So if Josh Kelly don't take the fight, Bakram, Bakram might not take it either, leaving the number three ranked Charles Conwell of the United States at number three. He would be the next highest ranked contender. Stiffer competition, I think, than either Josh Kelly or Bakram Mertesaliev. Charles, though, he's been missing in action and his career is somewhat in limbo. Haven't heard too much about that guy the last couple of months. Ranked right behind Charles Conwell is Puerto Rico's own Xander Zayas, who fights on the top rank ESPN side of things. I mean, you see how these ranks stack up and you see where the interesting fights are. That Tim Zhu, he could end up fighting one or some of these guys and some of these guys, they're stiffer competition than some others. That title's gonna go vacant soon. It's only a matter of time. That is, it's either the title is going to go vacant and Tim is going to have to fight someone for it or he'll be upgraded to full champion status and have to fight his mandatory challenger whether it's Josh Kelly or someone else. I think he knocks out Josh Kelly. Josh Kelly's not a big puncher. He ain't got the firepower to keep Tim off of him and the pace that Tim sets for a fight. Josh Kelly being more finesse than ferocity, more flash than substance. I mean, I think Zoo versus Kelly would end the same way Kelly versus Avenesian ended. It ends with Josh Kelly getting his fucking clock cleaned. Now let's see if the powers that be don't make that fight happen. Now, as it pertains to Jermel Charlo, Canelo Alvarez, their upcoming fight, the outcome, and what the WBC means to do afterwards, the WBC will not officially order Canelo to defend his undisputed super middleweight world titles versus David Benavidez until March of 2024, one year after he won the WBC interim belt and mandatory position. WBC President Mauricio Suleiman has said some may think that some might think of that as cause for concern but these are people with very low iqs low brain power because we already know what canelo alvarez means to do this year how he's going to cap off the year so a benavidez fight was always going to be held out until next year held off if anything this should be cause for celebration for david benavidez's small faction of fans a very small circle of misguided individuals who are under the impression that canelo has some Something to be afraid of in this very basic basic fighter this should be cause for celebration because now they have a time frame what this essentially means is that david is next that if canelo alvarez takes care of business in his very next fight and he beats germel charlo in whatever fashion decision or by way of knockout david benavidez is next in the queue he's next on the itinerary because well think about it Jermall Charlo, some people thought that he might be next, and there was reason enough to believe that, but Jermall doesn't have a fight date. It's looking more and more like Jermall is going to sit out all of this year. There's still time. There is still enough months left in this year that you could, at least in theory, schedule him to keep busy fight. But the fact of the matter is, there isn't even a tentative fight date for Jermall Charlo. And if he don't fight all of this year, he won't be ready to face Canelo early next year. David, on the other hand, you have to wonder what what David's gonna do on the heels of this news. Is he going to fight someone in the fall? Because if he doesn't, what this news essentially heralds is a Cinco de Mayo showdown between Canelo Alvarez and David Benavidez. That's the gist of it. That 
By March of next year, the fight will be ordered. They'll have to enter negotiations if Canelo wants to keep the green belt. And I think he does. From the moment they announced that three-fight deal that Canelo entered into with the PBC, I long maintained that in all likelihood, David is a part of that plan. He's a part of that three-fight deal. Now, this order from the WBC... Sets up a Cinco de Mayo showdown between them, which would be a very big fight for the PBC in Showtime. An even bigger fight than the upcoming Canelo versus Charlo fight. David Benavidez by himself is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Worthless. You know, for all the hype that has surrounded him the last year, or so, maybe two years. Two. Not two, that many people two, bought his pay per view with Caleb Plant because all the hype that surrounds him is in reference to a Canelo fight. If he can get a Canelo fight, and that fight would be a big fight, but outside of that, people don't seem too interested. Caleb Plant pay per view sold next to nothing. March of next year. And between March of this year and March of next year, that makes a year. That makes a year's time in between fights for David Benavidez. It does. It'd be over a year by the time he climbs in the ring with Canelo if the fight were to take place on Cinco de Mayo, you have to wonder how David is going to use the time. Knowing that there is an impending order for March of next year, what is he going to decide to do for the remainder of this one? Is he going to have a fight? Is it going to be David Morrell? Or is he going to sit out in the hopes that he can play it safe and make it to that fight with Canelo next year? He blew off the idea that he would fight David Morrell this upcoming fall. He rejected that idea, but said he was open to fighting Jaime Munguia. I don't get the sense that we're on the eve of Benavidez versus Munguia. So if he's not fighting him, and he doesn't seem to be interested in fighting David Morrell, because David could jeopardize the Canelo fight next year, what's David's going to do? Is he going to sit out the remainder of this year? Don't put it past him. He only fought once last year. Massive waste of time. He's not under any obligation to fight David Morrell later on this year, you understand. That's an option. That's just an option for David Benavidez. And because he might be closer to a Canelo fight than he's ever been, he might actually elect to sit out the rest of this year. As ridiculous as that sounds. No, I don't put it past him. It's not conducive towards the victory, having a year span in between fights. Over a year if they end up fighting Cinco de Mayo and David don't get another fight in this year, but that's the way it looks. If he don't schedule another fight this year, that's the skinny.